Great. Thank you, Julia, for those um, really important remarks. I think one of the most important things to recognize, and you've kicked it off beautifully, is how important the transition is in understanding how societies will respond to the challenges that face us, whether they're demographic or health, in the 21st century. And that we are at this kind of crossroads, as much as the 1960s were important for a whole set of civil and health um, sort of causes, we now face a kind of second transition. So um, the title of my talk actually is Dem Demography is Not Destiny. Demography rolls out. We have something to do with it, and in other ways it, it sort of rolls out independently. But our response to it um, does matter a lot. And the degree to which we have societies that are resilient, that can change and be moderated um, by the demographic sort of challenges that they face will actually determine the success um, that we have in meeting these challenges. And I think the issues of global governance um, illustrate this very, very importantly. So I want to talk a little bit about the overall agenda that we have. We've actually asked the three speakers and then our panel um, quite intentionally because they reflect the main points that after sort of five years in our second five year, um, my second five year term um, as director that we think are really important in the coming years. So number one is the issue of women work and health. And here again, if we looked at what was happening in the 1960s, there was enormous sort of focus on reproductive health. And we now recognize that um, women leading productive lives is very, very central to the well-being of the world and in inextricably linked to reproductive health. So we have asked um, Baba Tundeosa Taiman, who is going to talk about um, UNFPA and 20 years post Cairo, to talk some more about this, and I'll go into it a little bit. The second theme that's central that Julio has um, also mentioned is growing and aging societies. So in 1960s, we had this population bomb. Um, and the question now is sort of boom or bust. Like the population has grown, that's clear. Um, and there's been this simultaneous aging. The third issue that um, Michael Marmot will talk about is inequality in health. As I said yesterday, we're 50 years post the war on poverty. There are some ways in which we've made, I guess I would modestly say, a little progress, and some ways in which we really are, um, haven't made very much progress at all and are stuck very much in a very central debate about the degree of inequalities that we will tolerate both within societies and across societies. The fourth one is sustainability and development and climate change. This is an area that um, has been very core to the POP Center. Um, in fact, it was, I think, the reason that Roger Revelle started the POP Center originally was to think about the ways in which population drove um, climate change and global sort of sustainability, and we now have come to realize, and I think all the Millennium Goals now, don't talk about development as development in itself, but always linked with sustainability. So as we think about development in the coming years, we have to think about sustainable development. Um, and finally, a word that I thought I um, had invented till I Googled it a couple of days ago um, is populomics. So, um, you know, there's been this explosion in genomics and um, proteomics and all kinds of things that burrow down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, yet there is nothing that faces how population dynamics really will be dealt with and the kinds of data that we need. And there's a huge technology revolution coming down, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So those are the areas that I'm going to talk about briefly and then we'll turn it over to our speakers. So number one, women, work, and health. This is a picture of um, Cairo um, conference in uh, 1994. Um, this is our famous uh, yellow book uh, on population policies reconsidered um, that was edited um, by Gita Sen, um, Adrian Germain, and Lincoln Chen that actually took us, I think, from what was um, a focus on reproductive health and birth control and fertility to one in which we considered um, human rights and empowerment and education of women. And many of the Pop Center people were authors of that. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we sit today, especially in the United States. 
So this is life expectancy at birth in 22 OECD countries between 1980 and 2008. These data were from a National Academy of Sciences panel on diverging trends in life expectancy um, that I was a member of. And I think we were all stunned as we started to produce these data. So the red dots are the United States. And you can see in the 1980s, and actually if you go back to the 1960s, we were kind of in the middle of the pack. We were never terrific, but we were never like at the bottom. And over time, what has happened is that virtually every other industrialized nation has overtaken us. That for women's health particularly, um, life expectancy has virtually stagnated over this period. We now sit at the bottom of all OECD countries in terms of life expectancy. So this National Academy of Sciences panel actually was going to address these concerns. They came up with a specific set of, um, of policies and pro potential causes, all of which I found completely um, inadequate. And I think most of the panel found them to be really inadequate as well. Smoking certainly accounts for some of this, but not enough. So I want to show you an area that we're concentrating on that we think accounts for it. But I also want to show you some more staggering data um, on mortality rates for women um, recently. So in the last um, several years, mortality rates for women have worsened in 42% of counties in the United States. So the red dots actually represent counties where women have lost years of life expectancy um, during a very short period of time between 1992 and 2006. These are, uh, this is a study done by Dave Kindig, um, which I find really shocking. You can look at the areas, they're all over. They're mostly in rural areas, they're not in really big urban areas, but 42% of counties. That's something that you have to think about really importantly. So what's happened that could account for this, and this is where we get into the issues of um, productive lives for women, is that certainly most of you know that there are huge demographic trends in women in the labor force um, during this period. In 1940, when we made lots and lots of, whoops, lots and lots of policies um, about Social Security, about retirement, about whole sets of things, um, you know, somewhere around 5% of women with young children and 10% of women who had children 6 to 17 were in the workforce in the 1950s, that bumped up. By 2000, we're up around 70 to 80 percent of women in the labor force. Yet, none of our policies have responded to this challenge, not in the United States anyway. So these are formal social protection policies, and you can see um, where the United States sits. Um, so light blue means it's unpaid leave, um, just sort of FMLA and informal arrangement, whereas all the dark blue lines actually represent paid leave policies um, during this time. And you can see that the United States sits, again, at the very bottom. So you don't have to all connect the dots. I kind of connect the dots. <laughs> Um, here, here we sit on the bottom, bottom of this. We have this growing labor force concentration, and we have worsening health for women over this time. Um, so we have this idea that actually um, working is very hard for women, especially women with families. Um, and in fact, it takes a toll on people's health, and there are solutions. So this is a study we did in nursing homes in which we actually asked managers how they treated work-family issues. This is um, whether they were open to work-family concerns, whether they were creative and flexible. And then we interviewed employees in these nursing homes, and what you see is this is their cardiovascular risk, and people who worked for managers um, who were very open and flexible, have a risk of one, that's the comparison group, and people who um, worked for people who were less creative, less open to work family, actually had a twofold risk of developing cardiovascular disease over this period. Um, this is changing family constellations in the United States. Um, we know that over the years, the share of births to unmarried women has grown enormously in the United States, so that it now reaches about 40% of births are to women 
um, who are uh, not married. Some of them may be partnered. We actually have terrible data on this. We hardly ever ask the right questions about whether people are in important relationships um, so that we know this. But if we just look at the unmarried part, we see this really enormous change in how families are constituted. And this is a trend that is likely to go on. And here is the long-term toll that this seems to take. So if we look, we've looked at whether people were single mothers during their middle age and early adulthood and their long run risks of developing activities of daily living limitations, instrumental activities, or self-rated health. And what we find is that people who had were single mothers for long runs and at early ages had increased risks um, for developing all of these. So it seems like in the United States, being a single mom actually takes a long run risk on your health. That is evident by the time you reach adulthood. And this could be one of the things that is accounting for that. So number two issue, growing and aging societies. We're going to talk a lot about this. Um, here is a slide that maybe Jack will show as well. I'm not sure. Um, there are certain th slides, uh, the fertility one as well. Probably we all show the fertility one. But these are the young children and older people as a percentage of the global population by 2050. And you can see somewhere around now, there are going to be more people over 65 than under the age of five. And this is around the world. This is not just the United States. It's not just rich countries. It's not just Europe. It's globally. We're going to see this dramatic transformation, totally challenging the way that we think of aging societies. And the degree to which we have reached that um, point has varies, varies a lot by country. So this is um, the degree to which the percentage of the population aged 65 goes from 7 to 14 percent. And you can see some countries, France and Sweden, have had, well, France has almost 100 years to deal with this demographic transition, to go from 7 percent to here in 1990 or so, 1980, um, 14 percent. Sweden's had a really long time, UK, US really long times for us to come to grips with this kind of transition. However, look at Japan, which has had a much shorter time, done this really rapidly, and then look at other countries in the world, Korea, China, um, Brazil, huge countries that are going to witness this transformation in a decade in a way that nobody can really be prepared for, in which societies need to be resilient in order to adapt to this kind of change. Okay, so let's see if I can. This is an incredibly neat um, video that shows how the world population is changing over time. So this is 1970, 80, 90, 2000. <laughs> you get the idea. So what's happening in the world? So what we think of as a demographic pyramid when we made the rule doesn't look like a demographic pyramid by the time we get to 2050. And lest you think that this is um, just for the world, this is South Africa. So we now have a program project in which we're looking at South Africa. And again, even in South Africa, which is not um, among the fastest of these transitions, you see this pyramid. This is even accounting for a huge AIDS epidemic, which you see taking its toll early. And then as time goes on, so we're up to 2010 now, 2025, 30, 35, 40, and by 50, what this looks like. Challenging the way that we think. So three, I want to mention, inequality in health, a social determinants of health framework. Michael is going to talk about this um, in depth. So this is the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty. President Lincoln, Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty 50 years ago. How much progress have we made? Since then, poverty has fallen in the United States from about 19% um, to about 15%. 
there are still 46 million Americans who live in households in which income is considered to be scarcely adequate. And in recent decades, most gains from the private economy have gone to the top of the income ladder. President Obama has called inequality the defining challenge of our time, some central issue that we cannot ignore, so a very, very central feature of our research. This is a figure that shows the cumulative growth in average after-tax income by income group between 1979 and 2007. The green line represents the upper 1% <laughs> um, of the population, and this represents basically everybody else. And this only goes up to 2007, so kind of around the last year before the Great Recession during this time. So while um, things have changed, GDP has changed, it has gone almost virtually to the top, not to the top third even, to the top 1% or 10%, however we're calculating this, kind of staggering data. So um, there has been this idea about rising tides lift all boats. Um, and certainly we have followed an idea that Jeffrey Rose wrote about, and I believe in this a lot, or have believed in it a lot, that the distributions of health-related characteristics move up and down as a whole. The frequency of cases can be only understood in the context of a population's characteristics. So that is, as we get better, we all move together. And in some cases, this is really true. And actually, in many Western countries, it's been true. So this is what it looks like. Everybody changes the same. Time one is the blue line. Time three is the red line. As things get better, we all get better, and the curve looks exactly the same. However, it's possible that things don't look this way. And actually, I'll show you some data that have been done um, by um, Dr. Subramanian and Dr. Razak, who are here. Um, and others looking at the difference between this. So it's possible, actually, that people change differently. That is, some people change more than others. The bottom stays the same, the top moves forward. And it doesn't look like rising tides lift all boats. And these are data from their work. This is um, by Razak, who's a Bell Fellow with us, um, Dan Corsi, a fellow with us, and um, Dr. Subramanian who you'll hear from in our panel, looking at data from Bangladesh. Um, they've done it for many, many countries, look, looking at the demographic health surveys. Um, this is looking at body mass index for women. And what you see over time is that the bottom has stayed exactly the same over these years. These are decades. And the top has pulled away a lot. So people at the top have gotten better but people at the bottom have stayed the same. And they have a word, maybe you'll talk about it, Super, when you talk about it, that it's almost like a volcano, like we've hollowed out the middle in some rapidly um, industrializing and emerging developing countries. This is really problematic. This is not at all what we thought when we started to make these curves. So really profound. This has influenced my work greatly, and um, it's really wonderful to see how it came out. So number four issue is sustainable development and health. Um, and I think similar to uh, the, the figure that um, Julio showed, that social, environmental, and economic factors um, are important all in their own rights. Um, and they all um, are important to consider. But somewhere in the middle is this sweet spot <laughs> where things are um, sustainable, equitable, um, viable and really good. And that is the spot that we need to think about. And almost everybody up until now thinks about economic development or environmental factors or social factors without connecting and understanding the ways in which these three areas have to be integrated and we have to be thinking about what's sustainable. Um, so this is the 1960s, the population bomb. Um, this is the cover of Paul Ehrlich's uh, book. He says, while you were reading these words, um, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. So this was a very dramatic fact. And in fact, I think since then, there's been a huge controversy about how much um, actually family planning and Planned Parenthood and factors like that have worked compared to education. And there's truth in all these arguments, and I'm hoping that um, Babatunde you will shed, shed some light on this. But this is the way we thought about it in the 1960s, that the world was going to be overrun with many, many people. And again, 
you've seen these enormous declines in fertility in part because of the attention that population um, forces focused on fertility and actually gave opportunities for women um, for birth control in many ways. But part of it is not due to that. Part of it is also due to economic development and other situations. And this was actually the start of the legendary Harvard Water Program. I'm very sorry that John Briscoe couldn't be here um, today because he um, started a lot of this work. Paul Rogers, I thought I saw walk in, um, is here, um, started this. And this is Roger Ravel. And um, this is an amazing story of starting to understand the ways in which population and agricultural development might influence um, global climate change or uh, water logging and salinity. They did a very, very famous study in Pakistan, and this was the founding of the POP Center. So we're very proud that this always like traveled together, environmental factors and population factors traveled together. Um, I was in China last week at the 20th anniversary of the University of Peking National School of Development. This is actually Justin Lin who started it. Um, talking about the ways in which China is actually facing economic development issues today. It's a very, very profound and complex problem. So if I show you the next slide, you'll see, you'll see that this is China's declining ratio of covered workers to pensioners. So on the yellow, in the yellow bars are the number of pensioners that we expect, and in the green line is the ratio of working people to pensioners. A lot of this is due to the one-child policy, right? So fertility dropped enormously. Actually, very few provisions were made for retirement. Um, people didn't live long enough to retire. China now faces this huge problem. And for me, the complexity of this is the one-child policy was an absolute good for environmental factors, right? It was central, a central feature of China's um, both economic development and environmental um, health to be able to do this. They now face a situation in which, while it's great for the environment, families are in this incredible situation. When I was there, we, I have a student who actually went back, and um, she has one uh, child. She is the product of a one-child family, as is her husband. There are four parents, and there are eight grandparents alive in this um, one, one a small family unit trying to figure out what to do. So the complexity of the social experience of having a one-child family to the complexity of what the environmental issue is is enormously complex. I don't know, who knows what the right answer is. It's not, it's not at all clear. China has modified its policy recently to, I think, respond to this kind of situation. Really complex issue. So finally, I want to talk about our infrastructure and how we've really responded to this. Um, I'll talk a little bit about major projects in the pipeline, the role of training the next generation, and uh, this word that I thought I invented, populomics, developing a research platform for big data. So just in terms of major projects, um, I think, I hope actually there are many students here. Um, if you're interested in becoming involved in these students, we really welcome this. We have a program project funded by NIA on health and aging in Sub-Saharan Africa, focused very much on what Julio called, um, we call them chronic conditions, whether they're infectious or non-infectious. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is facing a huge issue um, with ongoing chronic diseases. We have another project on microfinance in India that's led by Rohini Pandey at the Kennedy School looking at whether microfinance actually improves health outcomes. Another one on macroeconomics and health that David Canning um, has looking at macroeconomic conditions in the United States and how it's related to health conditions. We have several social protection and health um, projects that all involve comparative, in this case mostly comparative EU um, kind of analyses. Jason Beckfield um, leads one set of them, I lead one set of them in which we actually look at social protection policies as levers for improving the health of people. A set of projects around international, intergenerational transfers of health in developing countries and issues around child health that um, Supermanian leads. 
and a set of studies on the effect of natural disasters and migration that Mary Waters and a crew in FAS um, Arts and Sciences lead in collaboration with the Pop Center. So we now have developed a full complement, I think, of projects that will take us through the next set of years and help us um, get some leverage on the kinds of questions that I outlined before. Training of the next generation, um, I think many of you have met and many of you are here who are our population and development fellows. We're very proud um, of this fellowship program. We have about 12 to 13 fellows a year, some of whom are supported by the Pop Center, some of whom are supported by foundations, Robert Wood Johnson, MacArthur. We have a Global Demography of Aging project. We have under consideration at the school a new PhD program in population health which actually is supporting PhD students um, in five departments in the School of Public Health and I think come to grips with this sort of issue very centrally about how we consider population health in the coming decades with absolute concentration in the five departments that they are, a very exciting um, potential program on the horizon. And as I said, we have other fellowships um, from places. So populomics, um, one of the things the Pop Center has tried to do, it's kind of an odd um, thing that while the Pop Center has been um, in existence since the 1960s, it's rarely housed very large um, big data of a quantitative nature that demographers use every day in and out, kind of um, what they eat for lunch. <laughs> Um, we've always been slightly esoteric in what we've concentrated on. And in this area, I think it's become incredibly exciting and very, very important for there to be a university-wide um, kind of repository and capacity to house very large data on a population basis that will allow us to understand population and health dynamics. So in the United States, we're considering investing in huge um, claims data. It's very um, interesting in the United States these days. If I asked you what the incidence of heart disease was for the United States, you actually couldn't tell me very well what it was. You could tell me for old people, you could tell me for a little substat, but you couldn't tell me nationally what it really looks like in a very strong way. So we need much more monitoring of this and with the Affordable Care Act, the possibility of having large data that will allow us to monitor health and then link it to other factors is really important. Globally, of course, there are a number of data sets and a number of opportunities, the demographic and health surveillance sites, the in-depth collaborations, there are a set of sister studies to the health and retirement studies in India, China, um, Japan, Brazil is starting. Um, any number of countries, and we have one in going in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's very important to be able to house these data with the kind of analytics that will be very important to enable students and fellows and faculty to come to grips with that. So that's a major mission of our center over the next years. So I'll just close with our um, mission overall, which is to improve well-being around the world by better understanding the interaction of demographic change with social and economic development. And of course, um, because we're not completely in an ivory tower, um, to produce population-based evidence that will inform policies needed to create healthy and resilient societies. So thank you very much.